So let's get started. Again, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to colleagues joining, joining us from Asia. Uh, my name is Anna Larson. I'm Communications Director for World Shipping Council, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this press conference on the six critical pathways to zero carbon shipping. Um, today, you will hear from Rolf Haben Janssen, uh, CEO of Hapag Lloyd, who will introduce this topic and set the scene for us. Uh, then John Butler, CEO of World Shipping Council, will be presenting the actual pathways. And he will then be followed by Jeremy Nixon, CEO of Ocean Network Express, and Tom Crowley, Chair and CEO of Crowley. A warm welcome to you, gentlemen. Uh, we have a packed agenda. So without further ado, I will give the word to you, Rolf Habanjensen. Thank you, Anna, and, and thank you, everybody, for, for joining us on this on this press conference on this uh, truly important topic. Um, I think today we are at an important point when we talk about uh, liner shipping. Um, as, as all of us are thinking, trying, are trying to do their utmost to define actions on how to meet uh, the commitments that have been made in the Paris Agreement. And in that, um, in that process, uh, which is actually a massive task. I mean, if we look at what's happening in shipping today and, and what our emissions still are, even if they have come down considerably over the last uh, periods, and the industry has already done a lot in terms of investing in cleaner fuels and adhering to the latest regulations, we still have a massive amount of work ahead of us. And, and in that context, I think we, we also have the 78th session of the, of the IMO coming up. Yeah where it will be very much around what do we need to do um, going forward and what are actually those pathways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And, and to succeed with that, uh, we believe it's important that um, we take some firm decisions there that really help us to uh, take all the right actions over the upcoming number of years. And, and in order to kick off that discussion, um, we would like to also share our perspective on that. And, and for that, I would like to hand it over to, to John, who will try to outline our perspective on, on the different pathways that there are and, and which we believe IMO should consider to ensure that we all decarbonize as quickly as possible. So, John, uh, over to you. Okay, <clears throat> Rolf, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, as Rolf alluded to, there are important meetings coming up in the IMO and equally important, uh, International Maritime Organization has um, scheduled to update its strategic plan for the decarbonization of shipping. And as that update to the strategic plan takes place over the next year, uh, we wanna make sure that the plan is up to doing the job. And so in support of that objective, we've identified six elements that we believe must be part of the new IMO strategic plan in order for that plan to work. And we've submitted those ideas uh, to the IMO in a filing uh, that we've just made and that will uh, hopefully be discussed at the next Marine Environment Protection Committee meeting that comes up in June. So what I'd like to do is just walk through quickly uh, the six elements of that, of that paper that we have identified as being critical to be included in the revised IMO strategic plan. Um, there's some more detail in the materials that have been circulated. So what I wanna do is really talk about the why for each of these elements. And I'll do them in the order that you see on the slide uh, on the screen. So starting with carbon price, uh, this is an essential element in any effective decarbonization plan. There's been a lot of discussion about this, and of course, uh, we've included it here. We have not yet put a number to this tool because that number has to be calibrated to put future fuels on a competitive footing with fossil fuels. And we need more information and more research and development to get that number right. The challenge here is if you set the number too low, you essentially just raise costs without incentivizing anybody to move to new fuels. If you set the number too high, uh, it's economically wasteful and that has a negative impact on trade. 
So this, this carbon price setting needs to be done relatively soon, but it also needs to be done based on data and analysis and not simply plucked out of the air. So what we're really doing here is inviting the IMO to have that discussion about what is the right number and how does this tool best serve the purpose. The second element in the paper is a well-to-wake life cycle analysis of GHG emissions. Here again, this is a discussion that's already started at the IMO. What we're doing in our paper is putting down a clear marker that the industry believes that the entire emissions profile of the fuel cycle from production through use must be considered in setting standards. Otherwise, we could end up driving the use of fuels that might look great from a stack emissions perspective, but that are bad on the production side, which would give you no net improvement. So you have to look at the whole picture. At the same time, we need to measure separately the well to tank and the tank to wake set segments, because there may be fuels that are good long-term candidates for green production that are today produced with dirty energy. And so there may need to be a phase in runway for those fuels. And you have to understand how the production and the consumption emissions fit together in order to make good regulatory decisions. So really this discussion is all about understanding the entire picture of the emissions profile of a candidate fuel so that that can properly be reflected in the regulations. The next two elements that we've introduced, I'd like to talk about together uh, because they are related. These are integration of fuel production uh, considerations into the regulatory calculus and also exploration of the idea of green corridors. In concept, both of these elements are designed to address the fact that maritime demand alone for new fuels is not sufficient to drive the investment needed to produce future fuels at the required scale. And similarly, those fuels are not going to become available all over the world at the same time. So the thrust of these two elements is that the IMO's regulations need to reflect that reality. And we have to build in mechanisms into the regulatory regime that incentivize green fuel production and the use of those fuels first, where it's most technologically and economically feasible. In short, if we try to flip the switch at the same time for the whole world, we make the problem much harder. And put in a more positive way, we need to take advantage of those countries and those situations and those companies that are ready to move forward earlier and give every incentive to those folks to take those steps. The next item that I'd like to discuss is the question of what new standards or future standards for vessel new builds look like. The IMO already has design efficiency standards for new vessels, and we've had those for a number of years and they've gone through increasingly strict phases. And as we consider the next phase of how the new build standard tool will be used, um, the question that we're putting on the table is whether and when to perhaps switch over to a new build standard that actually forces new vessels to be constructed to be able to use next generation fuels. All of the new build standards to date have essentially been set up on the premise of getting additional efficiency out of fossil fuel uh, vessels. If we're going to transition to a completely new energy profile, we need to look at actually making a step change in the fuels that we're using. Now that kind of approach would require, require uh, tying any, any new, uh, new build design standards to uh, 
either a readiness, a technological readiness standard, or the availability of new fuels so that companies know how to construct those vessels. And this is really a new approach to new build standards uh, that we think it's time to have that discussion at the IMO. And so the final element that I'd like to discuss, and this really plays into all of the other elements I've already mentioned. This final element is, is research and development for shipboard and shoreside systems. Sometimes you hear people talk about drop-in green fuels and the ease with which engines can be redesigned to use different fuels. Uh, there really is no such thing as a drop-in fuel today that will take you to zero. And the fact is that engine redesign is probably the easiest part of this overall task. The much harder piece is working through the many containment, handling, and safety issues that have to be addressed in order to produce, store, <clears throat> transport, and use new fuels in the world's fleets. And many candidate, challenge, many candidate fuels have real challenges. Ammonia, for example, is toxic and corrosive. Hydrogen is explosive and has low energy density, just as examples. So these sorts of problems can be overcome with the right engineering solutions, but that work doesn't happen by itself and it doesn't happen overnight. And that means that the sooner that the research and development gets done, the faster we can decarbonize and the cheaper it will be to decarbonize because we can avoid stranded investments in technologies that don't work out. And on this point of R&D, I would note that there is a fully developed R&D proposal in front of the IMO. It would be paid for by the industry and we continue to push for adoption of that plan and encourage additional IMO member countries to join us in that objective. So those are the six elements that are laid out in our plan uh, in a thumbnail. And with that, I'll hand over to, uh, to Jeremy Nixon. Thank you for your time. Thank you, John. Thank you, Rolf. Um, so yeah, I think that uh, the first, another point I think we would like to make is that um, the World Shipping Council represents all of the major container liner shipping companies in the world, as well as uh, some of the Roro carrier operators as well. And this is um, this green strategy paper that's been put together today and is being presented to you is a, a unified piece of work that is being conducted across all of those members. So, so we have a an industry unanimous agreement here uh, on on a strategy to go forward to decarbonize container shipping and potentially as well for the Roro sector. And I think that's a that's a really major development. I don't think there are many industries out there which have come together in a united way with a clear outline in terms of how they want to achieve this. And actually, in some ways, you know, we may be getting a little bit ahead of government here, but we want to work with the regulators, the IMO, and we want to work with the governments that make up that IMO and work together as an industry to decarbonize as quickly as possible and to reach quick consensus and agreement around what will be the regulations and what will be the protocols needed to, to accelerate that. And why is that? Well, container shipping is, 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 of course, one of the elements of shipping. But in container shipping, we are the owners of the vessels, we're the operators of the vessels, and we're also directly linked and interact with some 500,000 shippers and consignees around the world. So we have a, a quite a, a different type of uh, a very, very integrated relationship with our customers and with the, uh, the ship operations as well. So, you know, we are, of course, servants of, of global trade, but, you know, we have a lot of skin in the game. And, you know, we get a lot of feedback and a lot of push from our own boards, but also, you know, our own, our own staff and employees, but particularly from our customers as well, who have those same CSR type pressures upon them. So I think you know the rubber really hits the road in the container shipping industry, and uh, we have to work together 
to decarbonize as quickly as possible because we have a lot of interreaction. Um, you know, if you look at the scope one, scope two type, scope three emissions, there's a lot of overlap across the container industry. So we tend to use the same, you know, uh, operations, the same type of consortium mechanisms, the same type of feedering mechanisms, the same type of terminals. And therefore, if any one of us just in isolation does something, if we don't get the industry to move at the same pace, then the scope one, scope two and scope three type emissions get out of synchronization and, and it's difficult. So by moving together, we can speed up, we can get economies of scale, we can get critical mass and we can move hopefully the container shipping much faster and quicker towards uh, de decarbonization. Um, and I think in terms of the, the six points that uh, John's alluded to, um, of course, each company at the moment has its own particular policies, but we want to try and bring those together in this uniform roadmap. And uh, maybe just to give some examples here, you know, we talk about the targets at the IMO to reduce emissions, you know, by 50% in overall terms by 2050. Well, frankly, many of us, in, including my company, have already actually made the commitment already to go to net zero emissions by 2050 uh, through the getting to zero coalition. So there's already, you know, we're already talking about jumping ahead of the IMO in terms of setting more ambitious targets. Um, and I think you know, many of us are looking at our own carbon emissions at the moment and seeing that actually you know, we, we should be able to achieve the 40% by 2030. So in terms of carbon intensity, can, can we move quicker? Um, we're also looking at a lot of collaboration projects uh, individually with different companies. We're looking at ways to spend money on R&D. Uh, there's a number of collaboration centers now set up in Copenhagen in London and now recently in Singapore as well, where a lot of the container shipping companies are coming together and putting money in to look and speed up and see how we can do the bunkering, how we can get these green fuels on board safely and operate the ships quicker. So there's a, there's a lot of really good you know, things that are happening already. But I think by coming together in this way and working along with a common roadmap, we can try to move the container shipping industry to, to low emissions as possible, as quickly as possible. So at that stage, I'm going to hand over to Tom now. Thank you. Well, thanks, Jeremy. Um, great, great summary for, for, the, for the plans we have ahead. Um, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, about uh, Crowley, our family, our family business. We've been around 130 years and we've seen transformations from uh, a rowboat to a gasoline engine uh, to diesel power, bunker fuel, and now LNG. We as a company are fully committed to decarbonize, as, as Jeremy said, the, the industry is moving forward. And we have, an array, we have an array, our company has an array of ideas and projects in the pipeline. While, while each of these projects are unique, uh, we're seeing how important it is to get support from others, both within our industry and those that regulate what we do. We have LNG ships that are the first of their kind, and the rules that were developed as we built those ships were, were developed along the way. No one said we had to build the ships, uh, but we felt that the time was right and it was the right thing to do. Our biggest success in that project as it unfolded was the design and implementation of a first of its kind fuel delivery system. So as John pointed out, this was critical to the success because we needed a safe and reliable system to deliver that fuel to the ships. Without it, we would not be able to maintain the critical supply chain that serves the island of Puerto Rico where the ships operate. We deliver groceries on Monday that are on the shelves, we deliver groceries on Monday morning that are on the shelves Monday afternoon. And any, any disruption in that supply chain, as many of us have experienced, would have disastrous consequences on that island. So when we turn and focus on the scale of what must be done globally, one realizes it can only be accomplished by working together. We thank the WSC and my fellow business leaders here today for laying out these six paths that our industry so desperately needs. These paths are essential for us to be able to make investments, to take the necessary risks, and be able to rely on regulatory framework that addresses the key strategic issues. 
So for the, the, for the sake of future generations, our focus in the coming years must be to develop and implement innovative, concrete, and equitable solutions. And these paths will get us there. Thank you very much for the time. And Anna, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, John, Jeremy, Rolf, Tom. Uh, very happy to have you here. Um, journalists, please feel free to contact us for any follow-up interviews or additional questions. And uh, we look forward to uh, speaking with you again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.